Imagine if a small country from Europe today, like Serbia, of 7 million people, was planning to invade a huge country like India. That would seem completely ludicrous to you. Imagine now if it was a private company from Serbia that wanted to conquer India. You would think that is even more ludicrous. Well, amazingly, this is what happened in the 18th century. Britain, which back then was 7 million people too, or specifically a private colony from Britain, was able to conquer, you guessed it, India. Why did they do it? How did they do it? What was the impact in India? This is what we are going to find out today. In some of the previous videos, we have covered the European exploration of East Asia. I'm not going to go over the material a second time, but roughly, if you remember well, in 1497-99, Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese explorer, found a new way to get uh, to India by rounding up the coast of South Africa. He was hoping to monopolize that kind of trade between Europe and Asia, but in the years that followed, the French, the British, the Dutch also got in on the action. Why did they come to India? Mostly for the spice trade initially, but also to trade jewels and also to trade textiles. By the 18th century, as we saw, you had two major private companies competing for the trade of India. On the French side, you would have something called the Compagnie des Indes Orientales, and on the British side, something called the East India Company, which is the same thing translated into English. And there was some big rivalry where, for a while, the French seemed like they were poised to conquer India because a local dynasty, the so-called Mughal dynasty, a Muslim empire in northern India, uh, was in its death throes, was in full decline by the 18th century. So that eventually led to a major war called the Seven Year War, which lasted mm, seven years, 1756 to 1763, the same thing that you call the French and Indian War in the US history course. And that ended with a resounding British victory, whether it's in Canada, or the Caribbean, or the coast of Africa, or in our case, India, where the private company, the East India Company, was able to elbow out the French company, the Compagnie des Indes Orientales, and the same process kind of uh, bring the Mughal dynasty to an end. So that's kind of uh, where we were uh, when we stopped in the last few videos. So what happens next? How would the East India Company, which is just a private company of a very small nation from Europe, Britain, how were they able to conquer all of India? Well, for one thing, you could use local mercenaries, because to get soldiers all the way from Britain to India would cost quite a bit of money, especially since the soldiers would be mercenaries. The East India Company, being a private company, could not have a draft in Europe. Instead, they would have to, to pay people to fight and potentially die uh, for that private company. So you could either bring soldiers all the way from Britain, which is very costly, and you only do that for some officers and such, and the vast bulk of your army, meaning like the privates, the rank and file, you would try to recruit locally. These would be known in India as the Sepoy. And whether they're Sikh, or Muslim, or Hindu, they would be recruited locally or from Nepal, where you have a group called the Gurkhans that were fierce warriors and often used for that purpose. So the answer to the question, how was Britain able to conquer India, to a large extent, it's with uh, local Indian troops. What about the money? Because money is also what finances wars. Well, one of the early provinces that was conquered by the EIC was a province of Bengal in northeast India uh, that corresponds to the area around Calcutta and Bangladesh today. As the EIC took over that province, they realized that there was far more money to be made in the raising of taxes than in the traditional activities like, say, the textile or the spice trade. Once you conquered India, uh, specifically Bengal, you would have the ability to raise a tax called the Diwani. And so the EIC started making a, a, a ton of money through the Diwani in Bengal that could then be used to hire more sepoys and conquer more provinces that you could then tax and hire more mercenaries, and you see how the process goes from there. So that would mean that some of the people from Britain that were agents of the EIC uh, made a fortune in those early years in the late 18th century in Bengal. Uh, they were known after a local term as the Nabobs, N-A-B-O-B, -B, uh, meaning rich agents of the EIC that made a fortune in Bengal. Uh, that term is in the dictionary. You might not employ it too often, but nowadays it means some uh, like very rich person, a nabob. So try to use that in everyday conversation. And when people ask you about the etymology of the term, now you have some, uh, some stuff to spice up your next dinner conversation. 
And so little by little, the EIC was able to conquer more and more of India, and I can't give you a specific date. It's kind of a gradual process, so late 18th, early 19th century, uh, where every province that you get gives you more money to hire more mercenaries and conquer another province. And you're able to do that because your main strategic rival, the French, uh, were forced out of the region uh, at the end of the Seven Year War, the Treaty of Paris, 1763. And the other main strategic rival, the Muslim dynasty of the Mughals, uh, were in their death throes. As the British, by the early 19th century, were able to conquer all of India, and by British I mean that private company, the question was, how do you rule them? Are you going to oust all the local bureaucracy and replace them uh, with some uh, public servants sent from Britain? Again, uh, the cost would be enormous, and as a result, the British uh, tried as much as possible to rule India through local people. So uh, the map of India that I'm showing you right now looks a bit like a leopard skin kind of map in that some areas would be governed directly through uh, British servants, but many of the other, other areas that you see in different colors uh, would be ruled through local princes or Maharajas, they would be called. Some of them Muslim, uh, some of them Hindu, or even Sikh, the various religions of India. And so the deal would be that when you conquer a province, uh, you tell the local Maharaja you can remain in office, more as a figurehead than anything else, uh, and now you have a pro-consul, a British agent next to you, calling the shots and telling you what to do, you're more of a puppet at that point. But the entirety of the administration remains in place so that when it comes to collecting taxes, police, education, sewage system, what have you, all that would still be done by the same existing institution. So you can control a whole huge region with just one uh, British agent, one proconsul advising in the Maharaja. This system would be known as the Raj, R-A-J, a term that refers to the British rule in India, and more generally that habit of ruling India through as much as possible local hierarchies. And that allowed the British to control eventually, through a private company, a huge subcontinent. Uh, the totality of the people involved in the Indian civil service, meaning the, the people sent from Britain to, to rule in India, was in the neighborhood of, I think, 2,000 people, which is impressively small for ruling a subcontinent. As a point of comparison, the United States today, which is also home to 300 million people, has a thorough bureaucracy of 2 million people, and that does not even include the post office. On top of that, in the summertime, when the heat of the Indian plain became unbearable, uh, most of these employees would then gravitate towards Simla, which was the summer capital in the Himalayan mountains. So a very, very light footprint indeed. After that, you would have a lot of Indian civil servants that would supplement those numbers. But the idea was to have as light a touch as you can. So to answer the question, how were the British able uh, to, to conquer India? The answer is, well, largely it was Indian money, Indian troops, and eventually Indian civil servants. What about the motives? Well, we saw them initially coming for the spice trade, the textile trade, eventually collecting the Diwani. So there are financial interests, and that's not a big surprise. This is the EIC, a private company, the war model of the age, so they're in there for them to make money. Uh, but then eventually, as uh, India became the crown jewel of the British Empire, some strategic motives also played a role. That the British were very concerned that other major European rivals might uh, approach India, and that incited you to cover even more territories. Uh, specifically in Southeast Asia, to the east of India, uh, the French in the 19th century established a foothold in what they called Indochina, and that would be Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos today. And the fear would be that they would be pushing west from there into Burma and eventually Bangladesh and India, and maybe encroach on British territory. Coming from the north, uh, the Russians were expanding aggressively into Central Asia in the 19th century, and they were also a rival of Britain. And so there was a fear that the, Brit uh, that the uh, Russians, after conquering what is today Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, would be pushing south because the Russians were always interested in getting access to warmer tropical waters to have a year-round port. Well, that would mean that they would push into Afghanistan, eventually Persia, Pakistan, uh, and India today. Uh, this rivalry with the Russians became known as the Great Game. And you have a lot of efforts in the 19th century by the British, by the Russians, to send secret agents in Central Asia in a game of a cat and mouse to know what the other person is up to and try to push uh, your pawns on a chessboard, uh, so to speak, the great game. So when it came to expanding further, then the, the British were interested in getting more colonies, not so much for the value of them, but more to serve as a buffer zone uh, to keep other potential rivals at bay. And so the British eventually conquered to the east Burma, which is called Myanmar today, and Singapore and Malaysia, 
in part because of the value of those areas, but mostly because if you got them, then the French didn't, and they would not get anywhere close to India. And to the northwest, uh, the British eventually got a sphere of influence into Persia, which is Iran today, invaded Afghanistan twice, uh, and eventually had to withdraw twice from Afghanistan because that's the kind of a graveyard of empires. Very difficult to control Afghanistan. The Russians discovered it in the 1980s and the Americans more recently. Uh, but the idea to control Afghanistan was not because of the value of it. It was more to do it so that the Russians would not control Afghanistan and that's the way to keep the Russians at bay. Uh, eventually, the British and, uh, and the uh, uh, Russians uh, made an agreement uh, that to, uh, Afghanistan would remain a kind of a neutral territory as a buffer zone between their two competing empires, and to make sure there was no area where India, the British colony, would touch Russian territories. Uh, they established a weird kind of a set of geography uh, for Afghanistan, known as the Duran Line. And if you look very closely at the northeastern part of Afghanistan, you'll see a, an appendage that goes way, way out into the Himalayan mountains. This is kind of a long-term legacy of the great game today. What about the motives then? Well, initially it was a private company, the EIC, so they were in there for the money. Uh, what did they come for initially? Spices, uh, then textiles, and eventually collecting taxes, and that's how they made money in India. But as India became a key crown jewel of the British Empire, more strategic motives became important as well. You could see how the British eventually expanded the empire mostly to protect what they already have, what became known as the imperial creep. And by creep there, I don't mean that kind of weird bearded dude that uh, stalks you in the parking lot late at night. Uh, creep more as in a creeping phenomenon, where the more territories you have, the more you want to acquire. And when you have Bengal, then you want to control all India to protect Bengal. And then you want to have Burma and Afghanistan and Persia to control those areas. And then the British wanted to control the Suez Canal so that they have access to India. And then when they have Suez, they want all of Egypt. And when they have Egypt, they also take Israel as a colony and Malta and Gibraltar so that they have access to India. And ultimately, well, you want all of the world. I mean, you don't feel secure until you have colonized all the world. And even then, H.G. Wells might tell you he might have to worry about an invasion from, uh, from Mars. So that's kind of a way in which organically the British Empire would have a tendency to grow, not so much in that case for the economic value, but simply for strategic reasons. So what about the next question then, which is the impact of British colonial rule? And it's a very important question nowadays because we're dealing with the after effects of colonialism, and we'll see that in the last section of this course. A uh, big question today is why is it that some countries like India are poor, while others like Britain are rich? And one important theory out there is a the colonial legacy theory. Uh, the concept, which is uh, quite popular in India, among other places, uh, that the reason why former colonies are poor is that they were exploited as colonies. So whether colonial exploitation uh, was something positive or exploitative, uh, that's a key question for our present day world. So how good or bad was British colonization of India? Uh, if you look at an early example, and that would be the colonization of Bengal, it was pretty exploitative. Uh, the people that came were part of the EIC, they were there to make a buck. They were the, the nabob, they were there to collect the diwani. And you have some examples in the 18th century of terrible famines afflicting Bengal. And the response by the British is, well, let's just keep raising taxes and collecting the taxes. I don't care if the family there is dying, and at some point I think a third of the population of Bengal are starved to death. We are there for the money. And so you have people enriching themselves so that they can go back and retire in England with a huge fortune at the same time that you have starving kids in Bengal. And that doesn't sound too good as far as the record of the British colonial record. That might also have to do with the uh, kind of attitude that people have in England, which is very free market. The late 18th, early 19th century, the time when Adam Smith and Ricardo and Malthus come into being as economy theorists. And their big view of the market is that the government should be hand off. And I don't care if there's a famine somewhere, just don't do famine relief because ultimately that will just allow the population to adjust itself to a more sustainable level. And you have a similar situation in the mid-19th century when they let a lot of the Irish people starve to death as well. So that might be more of an ideological perspective that they have, not just a casual, callous disregard for the Bangladeshi population. Another important issue when you want to deal with the British rule of India would be more of the cultural clash. In the sense that the British came mostly as Christian invaders, and the vast bulk of the population of India would be either of the Hindu face, the Muslim face, or the Sikh face. And even though the EIC invaders at first were there for the money, uh, initially, eventually you have people that are uh, missionaries and such that head to India, and they want to refashion India in a way that is more British. 
And they mean that in a good way. Uh, Rudyard Kipling would call that the white man's burden, a desire to improve the lot of India, uh, whether it's by uh, improving the sewage system or combating uh, malaria or building railroads or great buildings, all which the British do, uh, thinking that they're going to do well, but in some ways would have a way to uh, kind of rub the Indians uh, the wrong way. I'll give you just a couple examples. Uh, one practice that was traditional among Hindus was the burning of satis, S-A-T-I. A sati would be a, a widow in the Hindu faith. And the tradition was, at least under, uh, for upper class Hindus, was that a wife was supposed to be so devoted to her husband that when he passed away, there was no real desire for her to live a life that was empty of meaning now that she was widowed. And when her husband was being cremated, she should just throw herself into the funeral pyre and then pass away. And I'm just mentioning what happened. I'm not telling you to try this at home. Far from it. So the practice of uh, sati burning was quite controversial. In Britain in the 19th century, they saw that as more of a barbaric practice uh, that the Indians did. And so they, they banned it. And there was a reason for it. Indeed, it is barbaric. And in some cases, it was not even voluntary. It was not suicide. It was more of a way to get rid of the widow of your, your brother and now you have another mouse to feed because she is the responsibility of the family now. So sometimes you have women who are kind of nudged into the fire just as a way to get rid of a, a widow who is uh, the responsibility of the family. So there were abuses, obviously, and the British tried to ban that, which is well-intentioned. Uh, but to many traditional Hindus, it was seen as an assault on their traditions and on their gender roles. And that was just something that went too far. Uh, I don't care if you're stealing my money, that's one thing, but now you're trying to refashion my society and that's another. And the practice uh, continued throughout British rule, in fact, uh, would go up until the 1980s, I think, as the last recorded example of a, a woman who was killed in that manner. Another big cultural class uh, involved uh, the sepoy in the uh, 1850s. The sepoy, remember all the mercenaries that are used by the British uh, as part of the uh, Indian army. Uh, some of them were Muslims, some of them were Hindu, and in the 1850s, a rumor ran through the barracks that a new type of rifle that had just been issued required some grease uh, to ease the cartridge uh, into the muzzle. And that grease was, and that's where the rumor kind of split, either cow fat, tallow, or pig fat, lard. And if you know anything about the Muslim and the Hindu religion, you know that it matters a lot. Uh, cows would be sacred to Hindus. Uh, pigs are actually uh, considered to be uh, dirty uh, to Muslims, and so for very different reason, uh, Hindus and Muslims don't want anything to do with uh, the, the bodies of cows or the bodies of pigs. Whatever the reason, uh, the sepoys revolted, and that became known as the Great Mutiny of 1857 or the Great Sepoy Mutiny. Obviously, uh, there's more to it than just a new type of cartridge. It's kind of building up on the long, simmering tensions. Uh, that the British had come along and tried to refashion gender relations, steal a bunch of money, conquer India, and also had established economic practices that uh, prevented a lot of uh, Indian businessmen from making textile of their own so that they would not compete with British textile. So you have a lot of uh, businessmen locally that would have lost uh, their income. So all of that is more of a genuine long-term dislike of British rule. And that just got inflamed uh, during uh, that period in 1857, the Great Mutiny. That moment is the closest that the British ever came to losing India up until independence, uh, that is. Because the British barely had a footprint in India, uh, the only way they controlled India was through the mercenaries and sepoys, and they're the ones uh, who do a mutiny. So Britain almost uh, lost India. In fact, uh, you have a long siege at Lucknow and different places, and the British barely, barely prevailed. Uh, in part because a few regiments remained loyal to them, in part because they had time to send some uh, reinforcements from Britain, and in part because they built railroads locally and they were able to shift loyal regiments around. So in the aftermath of the Great Mutiny, the question was, how do you deal with India? Number one, should we still have a situation where a private company is in control of such a strategically important colony? And number two, how do you deal with the Indian population that just revolted, you punish them, or uh, do you try to make them like England a bit more? Well, the British decided that India by that point had become so important that it was too dangerous to let a private company rule it. And so you shifted from the East India Company rule all the way to what was called Crown rule in the sense that the Crown of Britain would now directly control uh, India. And so the leader of India now would be officially the king or queen of Britain, or in that case, a queen, Victoria, who now became Empress of India, in addition to being Queen of England. It has a nice ring to it. 
she obviously would never go to India, so instead she would appoint a viceroy because she never traveled to India per se. So one of these early viceroys of India was a man called Lord Canning, and he had the decision after the Great Mutiny, how do I deal with Indians? Do I punish them, triple the taxes, punish ringleaders, start a famine or something like that? Or do I have a more gentle touch? And he decided to have more of a gentle touch. Uh, punish a few ringleaders, but might not realize what was obvious, and that Britain, being a fairly small country, halfway around the world, could not go to war with the entire population of India. You needed to have people on your side. And that's the way that Britain had controlled India through the Raj, and it could do so going forward. And that's what British people tend to emphasize nowadays when they think of British from India, all the good stuff that came out of it. We built railroads, great train stations, and sewage system. And indeed, if you travel to India today, uh, the vast bulk of their rail system is pretty much inherited from India. And plenty of big buildings are in the Victorian style because they come from that period as well. So there's good to be said about that and combating malaria and so forth and spreading the English language, which is still the lingua franca of India today, and English common law and all that uh, was good stuff. If you're interested in learning more about that positive uh, take on British colonialism, I would uh, recommend uh, reading the book by Nara Ferguson, who is kind of a conservative historian who did a great history of the British Empire, and he has a number of chapters on British India, obviously, and he tends to have a very positive outlook on all the great things that Britain contributed to the world. If you talk to Indians, however, they would have a far more negative outlook. Uh, they emphasize the famines, which continued throughout the 19th century, and you still have that callous disregard by Victorian-era governors who just let people die so that you have a more sustainable population in the long run. Uh, you still have a lot of money made by nabobs and such, and you still have a system whereby the local production of textiles was kind of wiped out by British competition, uh, where this was a country that was quite industrialized as late as the 1700s, but by the 19th century, instead, it was more focused on the production of raw cotton that could not be grown in England, exported uh, to Britain, transformed into finished textiles there, and then re-imported into India. And that set up uh, the stage for the kind of unequal economic relationship, which is still kind of the case today, uh, where a colony like, or former colony like India, would be set up to do raw materials, crops, and then all the industrial processes would be in the colonial power or the former colonial power. And so if you ask yourself how come some country industrialized and others did not, part of the reason is the colonial bond and Indians will remember that. Also of importance for many Indians was the Ilbert Bill controversy. This had to do with the way you govern the courts in British India. The Ilbert Bill, it's a bill, it's a proposal, proposed to have a system where if some Indian people had done enough of a law degree, and had the kind of expertise, they could serve in any kind of capacity in the legal system, including as judges in cases involving English people. And that only just threw the local settlers that were British into a rage, because that meant that as white defendants of plaintiff, they could be in a situation where you have a brown judge of Indian descent presiding over them in a position of authority, which completely upended all the racial hierarchies of the 19th century. And so you have a major uprising by the white population in India, which is sometimes called the, the White Mutiny, in reference to the Great Mutiny, uh, where they refused absolutely to have that Ilbert Bill, which never became a law. Uh, and so when that bill was uh, pulled out, you had a system instead where whenever you have a white plaintiff or defendant, you had to have a white judge, and Indian judges could only preside over cases involving uh, different Indian plaintiffs and defendants. What's the reason for it? Well, it has nothing to do with qualification. It's purely, it's purely based on, on race. And for a lot of the upper-class Indians who had participated in the Indian project, in the colonial project, and were willing to go to school and learn English and learn English common law and go to England even to study, they really understood at that point that no matter how much they tried, their brown skin always would put them on a lower scale than Englishmen. And so they understood the, the true racial underpinning of uh, the English colonial effort in India. That would lead eventually those upper classes, the Brahmins and such, uh, to embrace the cause of independence. And in 1885, the Indian National Congress uh, was put together, and it would often recruit uh, its members from upper class lawyers, like a young man called Gandhi, or failed businessmen that had lost in the textile industry. And so that would lead eventually, and that will be the topic for another video, uh, to the Indian independence movement of the 20th century. So to answer the three questions that we started off with, why are the British interested in India? 
well, partly to make money through cotton or textiles or the diwani, uh, partly for strategic reasons to keep the French and the Russians at bay, and partly to improve a lot of Indians, to ban the burning of settees, to spread the Christian faith, and to build railroads and such. How were they able to conquer India? Well, largely by using Indian taxes and Indian troops and Indian civil servants. And what was the impact of Indian, British rule in India? Well, it depends who you're asking. On the good side, it built railroads, combated malaria, and all of that. On the negative side, uh, you have all sorts of terrible things, uh, such as famine and the destruction of local textile industry. Also remember one thing I told you last time, is that in the 19th century, Europeans discovered that malaria and yellow fever, two diseases that made it very difficult to conquer tropical places like India, well, those two diseases were spread by mosquitoes. So you could protect yourself from that kind of deadly disease. Especially if on top of that, you take quinine, which will give you some amount of protection against malaria, and which you can find easily by drinking tonic water. And to make it even more palatable, add some gin, add a twist of lemon, and there you have a gin and tonic. And that's a true response to the question, how did the British, a small company from a small country half a world away, were able to conquer the vast expenses of India? The gin and tonic. In the next few videos, we'll be heading toward Algeria, a French colony, the Congo, a Belgian colony, and we'll top it off by talking about US imperialism in the Caribbean area. See you next time.